We are thrilled to have Sabrina Mashburn with us today from SoCal Sea Turtles. She is the executive director and they are dedicated to ensuring that every person on the water knows how to protect all of our local sea turtles through sighting and stranding reporting and through safer boating and fishing practices. And we are so excited to hear more about our local sea turtle population. And if you have any questions, please just put them down in the Q&A section. And once we're done, Sabrina will review all of the questions and be happy to answer them for you. In the meantime, please enjoy the presentation. Sabrina, over to you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sabrina Mashburn. I'm the executive director of SoCal Sea Turtles. Um, we are a small nonprofit based down here in San Diego, but we cover all of the West Coast of the US right now, uh, doing primarily adult boater and fisher education, but we also do public events um, for kids and adults of all ages. And what brought me to study sea turtles is both my love of dinosaurs and all reptiles, which I've had since I was a little kid, um, as well as my very first job in biology, which was as a bioacoustic analyst for the Wildlife Conservation Society's Ocean, Ocean Giants program based out of the Wildlife Conservation Society offices at the Natural History Museum in New York City, where I'm from. And I had been studying a population of humpback whales breeding off the coasts of Angola, as well as other cetaceans um, scattered around the waters of Madagascar. And desperate to see my subjects in real life, I became a volunteer for the World Wildlife Fund for Nature's International Volunteer Program um, and ended up falling head over heels in love with the giant green sea turtles in Madagascar that were being eaten and caught in shark nets right and left um, and, you know, arrived in Madagascar as a cetacean bioacoustician and left as a lifelong sea turtle biologist. And here we are today. I have my own nonprofit studying sea turtles, and I also consult with NOAA and the Navy um, about all of our protected species of the Southern California bite from black abalone to least terns to um, all the sea turtles and marine mammals. But of course the sea turtles are my specialty. Um, and when I first moved out here to attend Scripps Institution of Oceanography for my master's, I had a project all set up to study a uh, bycatch of green sea turtles and fisheries in Madagascar with the World Wildlife Fund that I had previously volunteered for. Um, and then about two months before our field research component was supposed to start, my funding fell through and the project fell through and WCS um, decided that they would prefer to use in-country people um, for the project that I had designed. Um, so I was totally crushed until I went up to the Southwest Fisheries Science Center at the top of the hill in La Jolla and met with the Marine Turtle Research Division and realized that we have a thriving population of green sea turtles that spend their time in between Southern California and Southern Mexico, um, as well as five out of the seven species of sea turtle that you can find on the planet. The only two species that we do not have here in Southern California are the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles that only live in the Caribbean and Atlantic oceans, um, as well as the flatback sea turtles of Australia that are non-migratory and are only found in Australia. But every other species of wild sea turtle spends at least part of their time uh, here in Southern California. So it's a pretty fantastic place to be for any marine biologist, but especially if you are like I am now a sea turtle biologist. And so diving right into those species, we have our California state marine reptile as of 2012, the East Pacific leatherback sea turtle, Dermochelis coratia. And of course, Dermochelis is in reference to their back. Um, it isn't 
quite a carapace as you could see in most other uh, more modern sea turtles living today. However, their back is covered in this really rubbery type of skin um, with constellation-like patterns similar to a whale shark, um, which can be used to identify individuals um, using the same software that they use to identify whale sharks actually. Um, and these sea turtles are the most genetically related to Archelon, the prehistoric sea turtle and the first true ocean faring sea turtle that was uh, over a ton in weight and uh, at least 12 to 15 feet long. These guys are also the largest living sea turtles, but they top out at just about a thousand pounds um, and between seven and nine feet, up to 10 feet as adults. So quite a bit smaller than Archelon. Um, and these guys have one of the longest migrations of any animal uh, living or extinct on the whole planet. That's including birds and whales. And these guys migrate from their foraging areas in Washington, Oregon, and primarily Northern California, but we will see some um, on occasion travel as far south as La Jolla on route to their nesting beaches in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and other islands scattered around the South Pacific. And this of course makes them really prone to being caught as bycatch in uh, fisheries and international waters, especially those that don't have the excellent oversight and onboard observers that US fisheries are required to have in leatherback migratory corridors, um, as well as ingestion of plastic, um, these guys only eat soft-bodied organisms like salps, pyrosomes, and jellies, and so they are one of the most commonly um, seen sea turtles to have a stomach full of plastic bags, unfortunately, because as I'm sure we've all seen in the popular media, um, underwater plastic does move very, very much like a soft-bodied invertebrate, um, like a jelly or a pyrosome. And then a more common sea turtle that we are seeing, especially around Huntington Beach and Newport Harbor um, is the Olive Ridley sea turtle. These guys were recently downlisted from endangered to threatened status because of the great strides in conservation that both Mexican fisheries and US fisheries have achieved um, trying to keep these guys out of getting caught in our nets um, and caught on lines as bycatch. And these are the world's second smallest sea turtles. So we jump from the largest to one of the smallest, uh, topping out at just over a hundred pounds at adulthood. The only sea turtles that are smaller are their little Atlantic co cousins, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. And both species of Ridley turtles are the only species that perform what is known as an arribada or an arrival in Spanish, um, where hundreds to thousands of individual females will all come to nest at the same time on the same beach um, en masse, sometimes even in the middle of the day, which is not stereotypical of most sea turtles. Um, and we think that this is a predator avoidance behavior. Recent studies, um, especially the PhD done by my newly minted doctor friend, Bree Meyer at uh, University of Texas, um, have shown that smaller individuals will tend to nest in the Arribada, whereas females who are larger and have more resources and perhaps might have more defenses against predation um, will also nest singly at night in the way that all other sea turtles do. So we are still figuring out why they do this around the full moon. They seem to do it just about every full moon at certain beaches um, in Mexico and Costa Rica and certain other equatorial nations. Um, and if you are able to see one, definitely do it. I am trying to get down to Mexico next year to see my first Arribada because I've never seen one in real life and the drone footage is just spectacular. So these little turtles are all over the world in temperate and tropical oceans. 
Um, but they were, of course, highly threatened because they are oceanic sea turtles. Um, they're not as close to shore as many of our other species like to be. And so they are really prone to getting caught up in big commercial fisheries, both long lining and in nets. Um, and here we have the very first sea turtle to ever be tracked in the 1980s by Wallace J. Nichols and uh, my advisor here in the photo, Dr. Jeff Semenoff, and here is Dr. Tomo Aguchi, both at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, um, one of the NOAA fisheries offices here in La Jolla. And you can see this little juvenile loggerhead has a transmitter attached to its carapace with some epoxy. Um, and this was actually the first sea turtle species to ever be tracked in the Pacific from their feeding grounds to their breeding grounds. And the whole world was astounded when we found that these little sea turtles that we see pretty frequently in Mexico and California were traveling all the way across the entire Pacific Ocean to mate and lay their eggs on the beaches of Japan. Um, and even more research has been done in recent years by Dr. Semenoff and his colleagues at NOAA. And they have found that instead of nesting periodically every three to four years, like a leatherback or um, Ridley sea turtles will nest about every three years, um, these turtles will actually make one trip as juveniles from their beaches in Japan to foraging grounds in Southern California and Mexico. And then they will stay in their foraging grounds until they're of full adult size. So sometimes for up to 20 years in those foraging grounds. And then once they make the trek back to Japan to lay their eggs and mate, after they lay those eggs, they actually will stay um, in Asian waters for the rest of their lives. So a really interesting um, and kind of aberrant um, pattern and life history for a sea turtle. And we are not sure if this is the same um, in our Atlantic sea turtles that head off to the Mediterranean and such. So we'll be waiting for more research um, on these intrepid travelers. And our loggerheads, just for a size comparison, are our second largest of the hard shell turtles. Um, so smaller than a leatherback, smaller than a green turtle, but still pretty big at, you know, 300 to 400 pounds at adulthood. And of course, my very favorite sea turtles, the ones that uh, many of us fell in love with in Finding Nemo or laying on the beaches of Hawaii. Um, and the sea turtles that spend their entire lives here in California, except for the few weeks or months every few years that they breed, um, are our Eastern Pacific green sea turtles, uh, Chelonia midas. And all green sea turtles on the planet are the largest hard-shelled sea turtles. So green turtles in general, whether you're in Florida or Australia, um, or the South Pacific will weigh between 300 and 500 pounds um, as adults. So adulthood can be reached anywhere between 25 and 40 years old, depending on the population. And they can live at least into their 80s, if not longer. Um, and their shell length will be about three to five feet. So this is a very, very large animal. And general facts about green sea turtles all over the world. Um, they have a comparatively small head and rounded beak compared to their huge body size. So unlike the loggerhead, whose head is probably three times the size of a green turtle with the same body mass, um, these guys are like an iceberg where you see a little tiny baseball head and then there is four feet of turtle um, behind it under the water that you can't see. And this is probably one of the reasons they get hit by boats so frequently is that they are really well camouflaged, their heads are small, um, and you're not often going to see their carapace breaching out of the water unless they're diving down. Um, and they can live for at least 80 years. There are a lot of stories of land tortoises living 
past the age of, I think, 150. The oldest tortoise on the planet right now is an Aldabra tortoise, who is, I think, 110. Um, but of course, it's very difficult to track a sea turtle, and they face a lot more threats throughout their lifetime um, on the open ocean and with all the traveling they do than an animal that's been at the same zoo for 110 years. Um, so the oldest that scientists have tracked a green sea turtle um, is a female that was nesting that was confirmed to be at least 80 years old. We're hoping that with new technology, including that uh, which was developed by my good friend Callie Turner Tomaskovitz at uh, UCSD, and she is now, of course, up at NOAA. Um, she uses skeletochronology when they find a sea turtle's femur bone on the beach in California. She can slice it in half and look at very thin segments of the bone under the microscope and actually count the growth rings um, similar to a tree trunk. And you can see when the sea turtle was warm and had a lot of food and grew a lot in a year versus like thinner bands when it grew less. Um, and we can also now inject a very small amount of the antibiotic that a lot of people take for their acne called tetracycline into sea turtles when we capture them to study. Um, and that will actually leave a faintly yellower growth ring in that turtle's skeleton during that year. It's completely harmless, but it's just a side effect of for any mammal or a sea turtle who's taken tetracycline in their life. Um, and that will allow us to gauge their age more specifically if we end up finding the bones um, or the remains of those turtles who were marked with tetracycline um, during the 2000s. So stay tuned. In 80 years, we will know more about sea turtle lifespans. Um, and that's part of the fun of studying cetaceans and sea turtles is that often we are doing this research to hand off to our students and their students. Um, and at the end of our careers or our lifetimes or, you know, in our children's lifetimes, the answers to our questions will arise um, and we all are working together. Um, and then sexual maturity in green sea turtles is very strange. Most other sea turtles are able to reproduce around the age of 15 to 20. Green sea turtles take much, much longer to reach uh, reproductive age. Uh, some turtles in the Pacific have been found uh, reproducing on mainland Michoacan in Mexico as young as 25, which we didn't think was possible for green turtles. Um, whereas green turtles in more protected island populations tend to wait until the age of 35 to sometimes almost 50 to commence uh, breeding and nesting. And so this is another big threat to their population is that they have to spend many decades out at sea, evading predators, finding enough food to eat, staying healthy um, before they can even start Start reproducing and contributing to their population. Um, and their breeding and nesting grounds occur close to the equator, um, except for the one population in Hawaii because they are non-migratory and are kind of trapped in Hawaii um, because they are so far from other land masses. But um, any reports that you hear of sea turtles nesting in California are absolutely untrue. Um, the only nest that any one scientist has ever heard of in California was laid by some sea turtles at SeaWorld in artificially warmed water who were trapped and could not get to Mexico to breed and had been given access to a beach. Um, and they had one clutch in all the many years that SeaWorld has been in operation. Um, and some of those little turtles were able to be released and we see them popping up all over Orange County and San Diego today. So thank goodness, uh, some of those individuals had a very happy story. But other than that, uh, sea turtles do not nest in California in spite of what you may hear or read in uh, dubious local newspaper stories. So green sea turtle feeding is also really exciting. We've had a lot of new findings in this area since I moved to California in 2015. 
Um, when I moved here in 2015, we thought that all green sea turtles all around the world um, were herbivorous as adults and only ate seagrasses and macroalgae, like sea lettuce is another favorite food of theirs. Um, and this, of course, gives them the green colored fat where they got their name. In case you guys noticed from the photos, most of the green sea turtles are brown or black um, or shades of cream. None of them really are green at all. But because especially in Florida, where they used to catch juvenile sea turtles and then feed them um, a high protein diet and raise them up in net pens up until 1973 when they were included on the first uh, Endangered Species Act and then ship the meat to restaurants all over the world and all over the US. Um, they, those turtles had green fat and that was called calipi and that's what they would use to make turtle soup was this green fat, so it had a green color. Um, but juvenile sea turtles are more flexible in their diet. This is why we see a lot of small green sea turtles being caught by pole and line fishers, especially off of our piers and docks um, and in harbors, um, is because young green sea turtles will eat anything that fits in their mouth. And this allows them to grow more quickly. Um, of course, animal body tissue has more fat and protein than most uh, plants that grow in the ocean. Um, and this leads us to our next point that it was recently discovered, I believe between 2016 and 2017 is when Dr. Semenov published the research that our green sea turtles here on the West Coast are getting about 50% of their protein from vegetable sources and 50% from animal sources throughout their lives. And so this really rocked the boat on green sea turtle science when we realized that our East Pacific green sea turtles are omnivorous throughout their lives, whereas everywhere else in the world, the green sea turtles are herbivorous as adults. And we think that this may be an adaptation to our colder water. Um, which really makes it advantageous to have a large body size as quickly as possible, because similar to a tuna fish, who is a functional endotherm, they can raise their internal body temperature warmer than the external water temperature through the coupling of their muscle movement generating heat and then their thick fat layer, that delicious Toro, um, insulating and keeping that heat within the body for a longer period without it all dissipating out into the water. And similarly, a large 300 to 500 pound sea turtle, or if we talk about our leatherbacks who can get in even colder water and are even larger still at, you know, 700 to 1000 pounds, um, when they move those big muscles and it's insulated by all of that body fat, they're able to maintain a much higher body temperature than the water around them, um, which can explain some of the videos that we've received of green sea turtles happily swimming up the Klamath River in Alaska, um, where they, you know, are not supposed to be, but sometimes do venture up there and uh, do just fine if they're larger individuals, whereas smaller individuals will see getting cold stunned at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if the water stays that cold for too long. And those were the first sea turtles that I worked with uh, in New York at the um, Riverhead Foundation for Marine Research and Preservation is we would get all these little like dinner plate sized green turtles and those little tiny Kemp's Ridleys um, and a few loggerheads as well, cold stunning um, and being brought in by fishermen in the winter and we'd warm them up uh, throughout the rest of the year and then re-release them in the ocean in the summer when the Gulf Coast touches the shore and the water is very warm in New York. Um, and you can look them up. My friend Maxine Montello runs that program now and they do amazing, amazing work over in New York. They're the only ones that do it. So our green sea turtles, what exactly are they eating here in California? They love this Zostera marina seagrass, which we have been seeing um, an abundance of, especially since we've had a lot of seagrass restoration programs, both by nonprofits um, and through the government, through contractors. 
as well as these cute squishy little nudibranchs, otherwise known as sea slugs, um, that are easy to catch for our sea turtles and pack a lot of nutrition. So green sea turtle nesting is um, quite similar for all populations. Um, I was able to find this photo of a female in Mexico who does really look like an East Pacific green sea turtle. Notice she has that darker colored uh, carapace as well as darker colored skin and scales. Um, and adults uh, as young as 25, but up to their 80s, will return to the same beaches where they were born. We call these their natal beaches every two to four years to lay eggs. Um, and green sea turtles are the only sea turtle species on the planet that actually does return to the same beach uh, where they were born to lay their eggs. And they do this um, through a little magnetic plate on the top of their head, similar to a migratory bird. Um, and they make a completely straight line using the Earth's magnetic field lines from their foraging grounds to their exact same nesting beach where they were born and back again. Um, unlike other sea turtle species, um, including hawksbill sea turtles who live on coral reefs, and they actually will circle an island multiple times and smell their way to their nesting beach um, without using the magnetic field lines of the earth at all. Um, so each species is quite different in the way that they navigate, but once they get there, um, they have a pretty similar nesting pattern. Um, our green turtles here in California nest both on mainland Mexico in Michoacan, as well as on the Rovillejos Islands archipelago. Um, there are only 57 people on the entire Rovillejos Islands archipelago in Mexico, which is fantastic for our sea turtles. Um, and we think that's why smaller, younger individuals are nesting on the mainland because they're more subject to predation um, by dogs and humans and cats and raccoons, uh, jaguars, everything likes to eat sea turtles, especially when they're slow and on land. Uh, whereas on the islands that are functionally uninhabited, except for a few people um, and a few Navy bases, um, they can wait until they're really ready and ripe to nest and breed without fear of predation. Um, and our females will nest once every two weeks while at their natal beaches. So they're laying a lot of eggs. They will lay an average of five nests or five clutches every breeding season. Um, and each clutch of green sea turtles, because they have relatively small eggs, will contain between 100 and 300 eggs. So that equals up to 675 baby turtles per female per breeding season. So while it is important to release hatchlings and make sure they get to the water safely because, you know, one in a hundred may survive to adulthood, our boffs, our big old fecund females or big old fertile females are actually the most important individuals that we want to safeguard, um, not only because each female can lay up to 675 eggs every year, um, larger, older females also learn from experience and they tend to lay larger clutches with more eggs um, and pick more secure places to nest. For instance, younger, smaller females will often nest lower down on the beach and their nests will become flooded with water at high tide or during a storm event, whereas larger, older sea turtles will often dig their nests under the plants growing just at the start of the dunes of the beach. Um, and these plants help to insulate the sand to keep the temperature regulated. And the roots of the plants also help to keep the nest and the surrounding sand in place um, during a storm or flooding event. So luckily for us, these big old fertile females are very commonly seen here in Southern California. Um, and so we have a great opportunity 
to protect these ladies and ensure the survival of our green sea turtles and to continue to see a rebounding population as we have been seeing for the past 10 years. So as I said before, green sea turtles are very, very cute as babies, but their shells are soft when they're born, similar to the skull of a newborn human, and they're just about the size of a chocolate chip cookie. So just about everything eats them. Um, and so without the human factor, only one in 100 usually will survive to adulthood, adding in things like vessel collisions, entanglement and debris, um, and ingestion of plastics and other trash, um, we're looking at many, many fewer than one in a hundred surviving to adulthood. Um, so they're very cute, but unfortunately most of them are doomed from the moment they hatch. And so really we need to focus a lot more of our conservation resources onto conserving big turtles while they're in the water. Port. from human and animal predators. So our SoCal green sea turtles, as we've alluded to for most of the presentation, um, are a little bit different than green sea turtles you're gonna see in other parts of the world, like Hawaii and Florida. Um, for one, their size, they're some of the largest green sea turtles on earth. The largest green sea turtle female ever captured um, was in San Diego Bay, and she was over 550 pounds. If you guys want to see a funny looking turtle, um, she had an interesting uh, upward curve to the back of her carapace, which gave her the affectionate name of Wrinkle Butt. Um, and she hasn't been seen since I moved here in 2015. I never got the chance to see her. So she may still be out there, but she was a very old turtle um, and so may also no longer be with us. But she was the biggest green sea turtle ever on record um, in the world. And interestingly enough, the sea turtles in Long Beach, Los Angeles and Orange counties are generally smaller and thought to be younger than those found in San Diego. And we think that this is a really good sign that the green sea turtles that resulted from the nesting beaches being protected by Mexico completely in 1992, coupled with losing that fishing pressure of the US fishery for green sea turtles closing down officially in 1973, has given us this kind of wash of young 35-ish year old sea turtles all over their former range in every harbor, wetland and estuary um, from LA to Santa Barbara, uh, which I have gotten to see since coming here as a grad student and it has been so exciting. I get goosebumps every time I think about it. Um, so we're doing a great job both in the US and in Mexico of bringing these green sea turtles back from the brink that everybody thought were going to be completely extinct um, by the 1980s. And so this is just further explaining that the size discrepancy um, is due to a difference in age, but they are actually from the same source population, um, which has been confirmed both with satellite tracking out of uh, Naval Warfare Station, Seal Beach, um, as well as from San Diego Bay and back again. So we talked about our Atlantic green sea turtles a little bit. These are much smaller. They have a sweet little rounded carapace and generally a much lighter color, both in their skin, their scales and their uh, carapace, we think which helps them to blend in with the white sand bottoms um, in the Atlantic and Caribbean as opposed to our Eastern Pacific greens, which have this black um, colored carapace, very dark, almost black scales um, and dark grayish skin, um, which probably helps them to absorb more so solar radiation when they bask at the surface. And you can tell when they're basking because they flip their little flippers up over their shell um, in a sleepy pose, just like a hatchling would um, and hang out right at the surface to catch some rays. 
Um, so look out for that if you're on your whale watching cruises. That's when we often will see pictures of them doing that behavior. Um, and they also have a little dip at the bottom of their carapace that makes the Eastern Pacific green sea turtles carapace shape more like a heart, unlike the Hawaiian honu, um, which is also a Pacific green sea turtle, but they have a round carapace and they're also very, very dark. Um, leading them to be called the Pacific Black Turtle. Um, they were almost characterized as a subspecies, um, Chelonia midas agassisi. Um, however, after analyzing the genetic data and the population data, the scientific community that studies sea turtles decided that DPS or distinct population segment is really a more appropriate um, way to refer to the different populations of green sea turtles since they are all genetically quite similar. Um, so I talked about how I got here in 2015, and this is actually a photo of the very first sea turtle I helped my advisor tag. Um, and he turned into a really famous turtle. I don't know if you can see on your small screen, but he's got a great big old tail about the size of a human forearm. Um, and this is in stark contrast to our female green sea turtles who at adulthood have a tail about the size of a human thumb. Um, and this turtle who we named Trey, um, one of the scientists' kids who comes out with us tends to get to name all the turtles, so they end up getting pretty cute little names. Um, and Trey was the very first male that obediently kept his satellite tag on long enough to show us his entire journey from San Diego Bay all the way to the Revilla Gijedos Islands in Mexico and back again. Um, and this was the first adult individual that we had seen make this journey. Um, previous research by Professor Peter Dutton at Southwest Fishery Science Center had pointed to our Southern California sea, turtle, sea turtles being more genetically similar to the populations in the Revilla Gijedos and Michoacan than they are to the green sea turtles on the Baja Peninsula, which we thought was pretty interesting. Um, and since this track was laid in 2015, we've actually had four additional adult female sea turtles also tracked uh, to Revilla Gijedos and um, Michoacan and back again to California. And so we can be reasonably sure um, that this is the same population and thus have a much better informed uh, management and recovery plan, knowing exactly where our turtles are both breeding and nesting as well as foraging for the rest of the year. Um, so when I was in grad school, the first thing I did uh, after seeing that giant sea turtle get hauled out of San Diego Bay and realizing that as somebody who professed to be a sea turtle biologist in training, I had no idea that we had so many sea turtles here in Southern California. And I realized that it was probable that there were a lot of other people who, like me, had no idea about these populations of sea turtles, some critically endangered and in need of our help, and others, like the green sea turtle, having a spectacular rebound and being a conservation success story. So I took a survey writing class and also added onto my advisory board a member of the social sciences faculty on main campus at UCSD um, and wrote this survey to find out what people in Southern California know about sea turtles um, and what knowledge gaps could be identified that could then be used to make education and outreach programming to ensure that everybody on the water is able to help protect our sea turtles um, and knows what to do if they see a turtle that needs help. And so in the beginning of this survey, I spoke to both commercial anglers and boaters and recreational anglers and boaters, um, a couple hundred up and down the coast of Southern California, mostly in Los Angeles, Orange and San Diego counties. Um, and I found that 43% of commercial boaters um, knew that we had sea turtles here at all, and only 16% of recreational anglers and boaters knew that we had sea turtles in Southern California. 
Um, and of that 16%, most of them said that the way that they learned about our sea turtles was that they saw one themselves. Um, and then they looked it up. So they weren't learning about it in school or through, you know, signage at the waterways like they would uh, marine mammals and seabirds and other wildlife of California. So next, I wanted to know if people were reporting these sightings because NOAA had been collecting sightings data for many years before I arrived on the scene. Um, but they said that only a few people responded and tend to be the same people over and over again. Um, but I also knew that their bandwidth for doing any sort of PR um, and public outreach was pretty low because they were doing all of this research as well. Um, and so when I performed this survey at docks and uh, tackle shops and surf shops all over Southern California, only 8% of recreational boaters and fishers and 26% of commercial boaters and fishers even knew that there was a, a place to report and that reports were being collected. Um, and so I had a feeling that if I could make this easier for people to report their sightings, we would learn a lot about where our green sea turtles are and where those sea turtle and human interactions were occurring the most. Um, I also asked if people knew what threats were threatening sea turtles here in Southern California. Um, and the results were pretty interesting because our commercial boaters and anglers were blaming um, plastic trash as the number one killer of sea turtles, and then things like oil uh, and fishing gear, and then boaters and swimmers were almost equal. Um, and then, of course, the recreational anglers and boaters were blaming the professional <laughs> anglers and boaters, um, as well as plastics and contaminants. Um, and interestingly enough, the real data shows a very different picture. Um, so I was able to use the stranding data from NOAA only for a few sites and only up until 2016, so just about a year of data. Um, the rest of this data up through 2022 is about to be published um, in 2023 in a pretty magnificent report put together by uh, some colleagues of mine at NOAA. So keep an eye out. We will be publishing that on all of our web channels as soon as it go, hits the presses. Um, but I can tell you that the numbers here that you see in the proportions um, are only magnified by the larger data set. Um, and so out of this 15 turtle data set, you can see 13 of them died from boat collisions, only two from fishery interactions, um, and none of them died from power plant interactions, disease, cold stunning, oil, pollutants. Um, sea turtles are pretty hardy animals. And even though they do have really high levels of contaminants, both in their blood and body tissues, um, as far as we know, they don't seem to have any measurable adverse effects to that um, that we have found so far. And of course, people are continuing to research that as our oceans become more and more polluted. Um, and so we are wondering why vessel strikes are almost always fatal to our sea turtles, whereas animals like manatees in Florida seem to sometimes be able to survive their wounds. Uh, and really that has to do with the morphology of our sea turtles, their carapace or shell is just a very thin layer of bone that's composed of their spine and then their ribs with very, very thin sheets of bone that grow in between the ribs while they're in the egg. And so this allows this carapace or shell to be really light um, and allows them to be really fast underwater. Um, and of course they pay for that lightness of carapace with it being very thin. Um, and although it is reasonable protection against being chomped in half by a tiger shark, um, it offers them no protection against being sliced through by a propeller 
or having the hull of a boat, as you see in the upper left photo, um, impacting the carapace, and then subsequently flooding the body cavity and lungs with water, causing immediate drowning. Um, and we have found, though, that it is possible if a sea turtle is struck and not hurt too badly, um, that to the minute, similar to first responder data in humans, the faster we can get someone out to perform veterinary care um, for a sea turtle, the higher their likelihood of surviving their injury. So number one, we've got to slow our boats down. Um, and number two, we need to get help to our sea turtles as fast as possible. So this is how we can help our sea turtles the most here in Southern California. Um, and that is first and foremost, if you can see the shore and you're on a boat or a jet ski, you need to slow down, like no wake at all, under five knots per hour. Um, because our sea turtles, just like us, when they're under the water, they can hear a single boat and get out of the way pretty quickly. But if there's more than one vessel under the water, it's really hard to tell which direction that vessel is coming from in time to get out of its way, especially if it's moving really fast. Um, and sea turtles tend to rest just below the surface when it's colder outside and the water temperature is cooler. Um, at night, especially around sunrise and sunset, they're kind of powering up and powering down. And this is, of course, the best time to spot sea turtles because you can just park your lawn chair out on the coast pretty much anywhere. If you see plants growing out of the water, even better. Um, and if you hear Darth Vader, you wanna look over to that noise and you will see a sea turtle and they will faithfully come up every few minutes, um, up to every four minutes and breathe in just around the same area um, at that kind of twilight turtle hour. Um, but of course, that means that that is the time we need to be cutting the engines on our boats and going as slowly as we possibly can, and also jet skis, um, any motorized vessel, really. And that will be the big factor in whether these turtles are able to successfully maintain their greater numbers um, that they have right now, or if they start slipping back into endangered status. And then, of course, please report your sea turtle sightings. Um, I recently worked on this map from 2019 until 2022, and I continue to update it about once a month um, with all of the sea turtle strandings data um, from NOAA, as well as sightings through our website, SoCalSeaTurtles.org, which sends a sighting report in real time, both to me to put on this map, as well as to the NOAA Marine Turtle Research Division to add to their GPS plotting coordinates on their master map of sea turtles. And this is what is gonna help us the most in protecting areas that sea turtles are sighted in the most frequently, as well as really um, ramping up on enforcement of existing speed zones in areas where we're seeing the most sea turtle strandings. Um, and you can see this is kind of zoomed in on the Long Beach and Orange County area. Um, and there are unfortunately many more red turtles than blue turtles in this region. Um, which means we've got to do a lot more education and outreach in this area and put up a lot more signage, um, which if you guys know anyone who has a waterfront home or business, they can get a free sea turtle speed sign from SoCal Sea Turtles. Just get in touch with us and we will install it and maintain it for free to make sure everybody on the water knows that we have sea turtles here. And then of course, Plastics, while not the number one killer of our sea turtles, are certainly coming up, um, I would say, as the third largest threat to our sea turtles here in California. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those little turtles that were born at SeaWorld in the nice clean tanks um, ended up succumbing to having a belly full of plastic and not making it. Um, and that's just 
you know, one snapshot of how many turtles we lose to ingestion of plastics, especially young turtles who may not know any better um, or may just be really gregarious feeders. We're not sure why, but young turtles are more susceptible to ingesting plastics. Um, so I always say, bring a bag with you to the beach, to the docks, anywhere you go on in or near the water. And if everybody took one bag of trash out, um, there would be a lot less for our sea turtles, marine mammals, and birds to eat or get entangled in. We also have these free brochures and stickers that I was going to bring to you before I got COVID. Um, and so I will mail those to you guys to make sure that you all have them to give to your family and friends and put on your boats or laptops or wherever you uh, may travel. It has the QR code to report sea turtle sightings, as well as a cell phone number for the marine mammal and sea turtle stranding coordinator, uh, Justin Bisbecki for the NOAA Southwest region on it. So you can contact him directly if you see a turtle in distress um, and get help for it right away. And these are those signs. We have one up at the Outboard Boating Club in San Diego. Uh, Captain Dave's Whale Watching has a sign up as well as the, um, the dock at the Wrigley Science Institute in Catalina um, and up in San Diego Bay. So we're getting more and more signs put up, um, but I've got a garage full. So anybody with waterfront property, please get in touch at SoCalSeaTurtles.org or through Facebook or Instagram. Um, and I will bring a sign to you just as soon as we can find a time that works for both of us to make sure that everybody on the water has access to that stranding hotline number um, and knows to go slow for sea turtles in near shore waters all over California. Um, and we also have these great t-shirts that you can wear if maybe you don't own a vessel, but you are out on the water or on the beach um, or kayaking. I try to wear mine as much as I can. And so do all my friends, because not only do we have this cute, it's not easy being green slogan on the front of our signature t-shirt. We also have a uh, a nudge to get people to report their sea turtle sightings and strandings on the back, printed large enough that hopefully uh, people will see it and realize that they can in fact report sea turtle sightings and contribute to this uh, wonderful data set that we have been building for the past 10 years or so. So of course, thank you to all of my wonderful mentors and supporters without whom the last seven years of this project and now nonprofit would not be possible. Um, I'm so grateful that I got into sea turtles when I did and that we're still here and that we are absolutely saving sea turtles up and down the coast and getting more and more reports every day. So with that, I am going to open up the floor for questions and I'll just take them as they come. So Peter says, what are the white lines on the shell? Um, I believe you are referring to the spaces in between the sea turtle scoots. Um, in some cases that can be a little bit of the underlying bone showing through a thinner layer of keratin similar to our keratin fingernails over our finger. Um, but often it is just a different coloration between the center of the scoot and then the edges of the scoots as they meet up there. Um, and they will naturally shed those scoots more frequently when they're younger and growing and then less frequently about every three months or so per scoot, uh, similar to a land turtle or tortoise throughout their adult life, um, especially if they get an injury or have some sort of abnormality on the scoot. Um, and then Curtis says, can the long possible lifespans of both terrestrial and sea turtles be attributed to their slower metabolism as compared to mammals and such? Hmm. Um, I think that's possible that they live a slower life. I'm just thinking about those cetaceans like northern right whales that can live for 200 plus years. 
Um, they have a, a much slower life than our, our shorter living, you know, bottlenose and Rizzo's dolphins that are only with us for what, like 10 to 15 years. Um, and so I think metabolism probably does play a role in that. Um, but we would have to ask uh, my friend Callie, probably Kelly Turner at the Southwest Fishery Science Center for a more detailed scientific explanation um, as longevity is not something that I've really studied very much other than reading her work, um, which is phenomenal. Oh, did you guys not hear that? I'm sorry. Um, so the, the long lifespans, I think you're right that it does have to do with metabolism being slowed down um, in turtles and tortoises. And I think also in our very large marine mammals like northern right whales, which tend to live for 200 plus years and basking sharks, et cetera. I think most of those animals do have a slower metabolism than something like a, a Rizzo's dolphin or a bottlenose dolphin or a human or chimpanzee. Um, but you'd have to talk to Callie Turner to Moskowitz at the Southwest Fishery Science Center for more sea turtle longevity info. Is that something that I have certainly read about, um, but have not studied personally in my career? But thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, there we go. And Larry is asking, is it okay to snorkel with the sea turtles in La Jolla? And if so, how much distance should be given? Um, thank you for asking that question. Yes, it is okay to snorkel with them is the short answer. The distance question is a little bit stickier. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, probably know, but the term harassment applies to endangered species like green sea turtles. And since we don't really know the exact distance at which the turtle is becoming uncomfortable with the proximity of the swimmer, um, there isn't a specific distance. We generally like to say one meter or like three feet is the absolute minimum distance that you want to be from the turtle. Um, but I would think more distance is probably preferable um, if you, you know, want to get close enough to take a look at them, but not so close that they start to swim away. I usually will use their behavioral cues, you know, if they're coming closer, I'll stop and let them approach me. Um, but if I'm approaching them and they go in the other direction, then that's too close for that particular animal. And I think that's the safest way, um, as long as you maintain that three foot or greater distance. A turtle was seen in King Harbor Redondo Beach on August 11th. Awesome. A friend sent a picture. Really awesome. Should I forward it to you? Yes, please. Um, you should use the sightings form on the website because that goes to me and to NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center at the same time um, because I'm only privy to a slice of the research that they're doing with the sightings data. I'm part of the kind of map making and um, community scientist data gathering team, um, but I am sure that they are using that data for multiple different studies. And so it's great that we both have it. Um, and so if you just send it to me, I would just fill in the form anyway and make sure it got to them in a nice organized way. Um, so thank you so much for reporting that sighting. I'm really looking forward to seeing the photo especially after spending eight days inside being sick. I can't wait to see a sea turtle. Are there turtle hotspots where they can be viewed from shore in SoCal? From Hannah, absolutely. Um, if you want to see sea turtles and want it to feel like absolute cheating, go to the walking path or bike path next to the San Gabriel River in Long Beach. Um, and find yourself a warm water outflow from the power plant, you can see upwards of 30 individual turtles in less than 30 minutes. Um, it's one of the largest aggregations of green sea turtles anywhere um, in the Pacific is actually in the San Gabriel River in Long Beach. 
interestingly enough. Um, and then another place where you can always, always see uh, the population of about seven to eight juvenile green sea turtles um, is in the marine room dive spot in La Jolla. Um, a friend and colleague of mine, Megan Hanna, did her master's research on that population and discovered there are indeed seven to eight individual turtles who call that little spot of ocean their home base. Um, so you can always see them there. And then other spots that we have been seeing a lot of turtles this summer in particular are Doheny State Beach um, right in the surf breaks, uh, Swami's Beach in Encinitas right in the surf breaks, and then Huntington Harbor, uh, Los Alamitos Harbor, um, and the San Diego Bay, especially the south side of the bay, as well as Agua Hedionda or the Carlsbad Lagoon, um, either right near where the channel is by the I-5 or back in the um, shallower parts by the nature reserve. So lots of awesome sea turtle hotspots here in SoCal. Happy turtling. Is turtle shell trafficking still happening? Yes. It's so unfortunate. And so Cal Sea Turtles is working really hard in partnership with one of our favorite West Coast sea turtle organizations, Sea Turtles, spelled out S-E-E -E, Turtles. Um, and they run this awesome program um, that used to be called Too Rare to Wear um, that is trying to stop the illegal trafficking and trade of the beautiful Hawksbill sea turtle shell worldwide. Um, and now they have an app that uses artificial intelligence where you just take, take a photo of anything that looks like it could be made of turtle shell anywhere on the planet. Um, and when you're in an area that has good enough signal, it will actually use AI to tell you if it's real or fake. And if the app thinks it's real, it will send a report to the local authorities so they can investigate it and take it to the lab for further testing. Um, and that is the number one threat for our hawksbill sea turtles around the globe and the reason that our Pacific hawksbills are so terribly critically endangered um, is that they have beautiful carapaces that are used for jewelry and hair combs as well as traditional medicines. Um, and, you know, we can't lose another one. So thank you. That's a fantastic question and a really pertinent issue that we're all working really hard to stop. Which beaches have protection for sea turtles? Um, luckily in Mexico, all of them, any beach where a sea turtle is nesting is protected in Mexico. Um, and in the US, uh, depending on the beach, Sea turtle nesting beaches are protected uh, sometimes year round and sometimes um, only during the nesting season. I know, um, I believe Texas still does allow vehicles to drive on the nesting beaches um, in some parts of the state. But besides that, I'm pretty sure that Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas um, and most of the other U.S. Uh, beaches that have nesting populations have really strict protections for the sea turtles who are nesting there as well as the nest once they've been laid. Um, and I know that the biologists in Texas are doing their best to safeguard every nest um, in spite of not having as stringent protections for those individual beaches. Uh, and certainly in Mexico, they're completely protected since 1992. And in other countries, it really depends um, on the country and, you know, how much their legislation is enforced, as well as whether they have enacted leg legislation to protect uh, nesting turtles or not. Um, but I would say most nations have some sort of protections for nesting females um, because there are wonderful scientists all over the world who recognize that they are the future um, of all sea turtles and that sea turtles are a keystone species in each of their ecosystems. Um, and it would be catastrophic if we were to lose any species. 
So the turtle shell app is called Seashell, S-E-E-S-H-E-L-L. Um, and I wonder if I can write that down in a chat box somewhere. Doesn't look like it, um, but it's S-E-E-S-H-E-L-L. -E -E um, and I might actually X out of my presentation because I would like to write that down. Let's see if it'll let me. No. Give me a black. There we go. No. And so <laughs> I will go ahead and look it up and I'll share that in the chat for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, and if that's all for questions, it's been such a pleasure talking to you guys, and I am happy to stick around for the full time. And if you want to chat about anything, ask questions about sea turtles, I am all eyes and ears and happy to talk about turtles until the sun comes up. Thank you so much, Sabrina. It was a pleasure having you here. It was a turtle tour de force. <laughs> and I know I learned so much listening to your lecture. I'm sure everyone else did as well. Um, maybe we'll see if we can get some of the pamphlets from you and share them with one of our next meetings. Um, but we really appreciate you being here, even though you're not feeling 100%. Um, Thank you. Yes, and we appreciate everyone else for their flexibility and making this Zoom webinar instead of in person so that we could still learn all about our sea turtle friends. Um, we did record this, so um, if you want to share it with anyone else or you missed part and you would like to watch the rest of it, we'll be posting it soon. Um, we are planning to post all of our um, backlog of our lecture series as well as future lectures on our YouTube channel. So we will be um, sharing that with you guys on social media soon as well with the link to this one. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sabrina. Rest up. Thank you again. I will. I, the voice is going, so just in time. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for hanging in there and we'll see you out on the water. It was a pleasure. See you soon. Good night, everyone.